Greetings everybody, this is Sweet Beats with Sweet Beats Tech Stop. We're taking another look at the innards, guts, insides of a Audio Technica AT RMX64. I've got a series of videos on this thing that I'm working on here in the shop. And uh, just want to share some additional thoughts, impressions, tips, uh, etc. as I continue to work through mine. Um, uh, some of the problems that mine has had is intermittent issues with uh, input modules not working, not passing signal, um, being dodgy, you know, you got to tap on them, try and get signal to pass, or they're just straight up not working at all. Uh, transport, um, not fast forwarding, maybe kind of rewind, not playing. Um, and presently the biggest problem I'm having is uh, can't get tracks one and two to record so that's the uh, that's the last issue that I'm trying to work through but um, as I have pointed out in some other videos um, the transport search online for a Nakamichi BX150 that's BX150 real idler drive tire or you can just do nakamichi bx150 tire um, that is the well you can't see it now but the the little rubber tire that's on an idler that flips back and forth to drive the real tables uh, get yourself one of those get yourself a new pinch roller and if you feel like splurging and having the best um, get the one from um, Athan Corporation. Uh, this is a very nice pinch roller. You can get on their website, um, search for professional audio products, um, pinch rollers or uh, rubber rollers, look under the cassettes section, um, and you'll find one under the miscellaneous rollers for the ATR MX64. Um, get yourself one of those and get yourself a new um, real idler drive tire and that will likely take care of any problems you're having with your transport. My transport is working flawlessly now after putting those two in and doing a little lubricating and um, just cleaning up some things. I have every single one of my um, mixer input modules and output modules and sub modules and then the six input modules working great right now and all I had to do was um, and look search for another video of mine where I talk about techniques for extracting the modules it's super important that you take care um, in extracting your mixer section modules if if you um, suspect that they've never been removed or not been removed in a while or you just don't know because here is, I think, uh, something of, of an Achilles heel for the AT RMX64. And I mentioned this in other videos. The, all of the boards, including the motherboards, are made from a phenolic resin type board material. Now, this isn't uncommon. You'll find this everywhere. But it's not as robust as glass fiber. I think that that is the more professional option. They are much more robust, they're stiffer, they're stronger. I wish Audio-Technica had, at least for the motherboards, used glass fiber instead of phenolic resin. The, the phenolic resin is much more, um, it's more brittle, uh, it's more flexible, and this is, you know, probably a standard thickness material. Um, it's not over thick, um, unfortunately. So. The other thing here too is that, look, so here is a motherboard that has six card edge connectors for one of the two card edge connectors that you'll find on the input modules, right? Here's the mother A unit. This is the mother B unit. I'm assuming this is mother C or maybe it's mother F. Anyway, um, Point being, look where the mounting screws are. You got one over here and you go all the way down to the end and here's the other one. So all of this section in the middle is unsupported and I kid you not, if you've not had the modules out or um, they've never been out, you're finding that they're stubborn, as you're trying to 
lever up this module to get this card edge connector to pop free, this whole board is going to be flexing and with the potential to damage solder joints or possibly, if it's really stubborn, could even crack the board. So um, that's why I just underscore using some careful technique when you're removing the modules. I won't go into the same detail as the other video where I talk about that, but it's uh, carefully pulling from just one end of the module, kind of rocking that and trying to get that to pop free. And you may even need to uh, put a tool down here um, onto the motherboard to hold this down so that it's not flexing and just pulling with the module as you're trying to get that connector to pop free. And then don't forget to apply some contact cleaner. My favorite for metal to metal contacts is Deoxit D5. I know they have some higher grade versions. I can't remember what they're called. I think there's D100, there's um, gold. Um, I'm sure that those are very fine products and maybe even necessary in certain, certain circumstances. D5 has worked great for me. Don't use F5 on metal to metal contacts. That's for carbon element potentiometers, whether rotary or linear. Um, it has lubricant in it. You don't want that um, in your metal to metal contacts, but spray some of that on there. Don't be shy about it. Put it on there and then exercise those connections carefully. Reinsert the module, extract the module, reinsert, extract. My particular ATRMX64 appears to be, you know, low miles. It's overall, it's very clean. I look for um, fasteners, you know, you can look on the fasteners that um, secure the dress panels to the chassis. You can look at the, at the jacks uh, on the back plane and other screws around the exterior. Look for surface rust. If those have some surface rust on them, then the unit's been stored or used in an environment that at least has some degree of moisture. And it's quite possible that your card edge connections are going to have a higher degree of oxidation on them and might, more, might be more stubborn um, to break free that first time. But I guarantee for you, if you carefully get them to break loose, and apply some of that contact cleaner and do some exercise in those connections. They will insert and extract much easier and you'll have better conductivity between all of your pins and sockets. Um, a product like Deoxit D5 not only does it um, uh, clean those contacts, it provides some lubrication um, for them to move easier. It provides better conductivity. So do yourself a favor and do that and just be aware they did not design these motherboards. I mean, if it was me and I was going to use this material, I would have had a mounting screw in between or adjacent to each um, card edge connector. You know, same thing here. Here's the mother, um, mother A uh, board and we've just got screws here and here and here it should have should have been at minimum um, adjacent to at least each pair of contacts so okay enough of that hopefully that helps you to be aware a couple other things to point out um, just lay of the land as I start to learn a little bit more about what's what on these I'll share that with you so maybe you can get a little more acclimated and comfortable with what's what on your ATRMX 64 since um, at this point in time, the technical documentation for this unit is still completely un unobtaining. I know it's out there. Um, I know that there are folks that have schematics, but they're not sharing and uh, haven't been able to find those. So all of these connections with the brown wires and the gray wires, these duck under this bulkhead in the back and go to the um, jack PCBs. So these connectors here, one, two, three, four, five, six sets of them, are all of your input and output jacks. Um, I haven't gone to the detail figuring out which is which, but um, you know your direct out and return jack, your mic input and line input. That's all these guys here. Um, and um, another thing that I want to point out 
you see these ribbon cables. People have sort of bemoaned these ribbon cables. Oh, I wish they didn't use the ribbon cables. One nice thing that they did, and I don't know if you realize this, but actually every ribbon cable is connectorized on these motherboards. You can disconnect every single one of these, remove the screws, and actually pull that motherboard out to service it um, if needed, or repair it, or whatever you need to do. So if you see these white um, blocks with these ribbon cables, you can take a small tool. I've got a little um, jeweler screwdriver here. And on this end where you see this little hole, um, that's the end with a tab. You can kind of get under there and pop that tab up and then this scissors up and you can see that there's a, um, a a ridge in there and a set of teeth on it when you put this down that goes down in here and pushes on these contacts and basically clamps the bare wires on the end of this ribbon cable into the sockets um, it's not a not a bad way to do it and then you want to take some care so I've gone through and exercised all of these connections as well in case they're oxidized you can do this yourself so you see that ribbon cable bare wire and then simply reinsert and it's a low insertion and extraction force because what clamps it in there is when you put this down click Every single one of those on each of these motherboards is connectorized. So, you know, you might need to trim some little zip ties off, but those are cheap at your local hardware store if you need to. And then, like I pointed out earlier, we do have some other connectors that um, best way to get these off, you can see that there is a uh, kind of a catch on one side. You can just gently tilt the connector and gently rock it and pull those free. So um, I wanted to point that out and one of the main reasons I wanted to point that out is because as I was going through and um, popping the lid on each one of these and carefully rocking and pulling that out and reinserting I actually found one where from the factory they had uh, I think gotten a little too excited with whatever stripping tool they use to pull the insulation off the end of these ribbon cables and when I carefully pulled it out one of the bare wire ends stayed in its socket and two to three more of them it was a six pin um, connector I think it was I think it was this one right here um, two to three more of those bare wire ends um, were loose um, and already ready to break off so that's why I've ended up going through and just checking all of them not only to um, refresh any possible oxidation in there and get a good contact again but just to double check and make sure I didn't have any more of those um, so I trimmed and restripped the end and reinserted uh, back in business um, not a big deal um, but something that you might want to check if you're having problems. Another thing to point out here, and I'm in the middle of investigating this, uh, relative to my issue where I can't record to tracks one and two, these green guys, these are relays. They might not look like a typical relay that you might see that would be in a more um, block type casing, um, but these are um, double read relays. Uh, four pins at one end, two pins at the other. The outside pins are the coil contacts. Uh, so later I'm going to be putting some flying leads on the outside contacts of each relay, putting the modules back in, powering the unit back up, and trying to determine what um, energizes these relays. I don't know if they're the record relays or not. My issue with recording uh, to tracks one and two, I verified that the playback amplifier is fine, 
All four tracks of the head are fine, the cabling is fine, because it will reproduce a known good signal on all four tracks. Uh, and furthermore, it's erasing on all four tracks, and I have meter activity when the meters are set to, all four are set to tape, and I have signal um, assigned to all four tracks. Uh, I have signal at the input side, so it's not an issue with signal necessarily getting to the input or record amp for the recorder section. It's not a reproduce issue. Um, it's not a bias amp issue um, or other record electronics. Um, uh, so it could be a record relay issue. I don't know for certain if the ATRMX64 actually has record relays or if they're using logic and transistors, but these are the only relays I've found, uh, so I'm going to find out what energizes them uh, first of all, and then once I find out what energizes them, I can switch my flying leads um, to the, uh, uh, the actual read contacts and make sure that they're working in the way that they're supposed to. Um, what else did I want to say about these? Um, there's three of them, so you might be thinking, well, Sweet Beats, those surely are not the record relays because there's four tracks. But they're dual read relays, and we do have two modes of recording. We have four track at high speed, three and three quarter IPS, and we have low speed, two track, consumer quarter track recording at one and seven eighths IPS and it only records to tracks one and two. And what I did notice is that when I'm at three and three quarter IPS, I definitely, every single time, cannot get recording to tracks one and two. When I switch to low speed um, uh, consumer quarter track stereo recording at one and seven eighths IPS, I can get signal recorded to track one. That could be explained if there's a separate relay for low speed uh, and which has two reads in it could be for two tracks and then we have two relays over here uh, uh, with two each for four tracks so uh, more on that later I've got to do some more investigating one more thing I want to mention if you are having problems with signal um, continuity into your input modules two other areas that you can check Remember, in the back you have insert points. You have a direct out jack and a return jack. That's just an insert, send, and return. Um, it's pre-EQ uh, uh, by default. You might not be aware of this. You can, what's called, sniff the direct out jack or the insert send and it won't break the line input or mic input, the mic or the line input that you have connected. So you have a, a send and signal will, is still supposed to pass through the module. If you insert a, a plug into the return jack or the receive jack, there is a normaling contact in there that breaks so that uh, it breaks the signal that's coming from that input jack. Well, depending on the conditions that your ATRMX64 has been in, those contacts might be dirty. Sometimes you have to take a plug and um, exercise that return jack. Maybe there's some oxidation on that normaling contact that's in there. So sometimes it can be good to spray some contact cleaner in there, like Deoxy D5, that's what I would use, and exercise that by inserting and removing a plug in there a bunch of times. And one more area, uh, that I found over the years um, that with gear from this era is in this input source select toggle switch. This is a really nice switch, um, I want to say, particularly for a for a you know a four track cassette recorder. Um, it's a nice metal shell um, toggle switch has a carriage type assembly in there and um, uh, gold, either gold or brass contacts. I think they're brass, uh, but it's a nice switch and you can even, if you're really um, desperate, you can 
undo these screws, you can um, uh, remove all of the solder from the solder joints and actually pull this whole switch out, disassemble it, take the shell off of it, and actually clean those contacts if you need to. But, um, not that you necessarily have to go to those lengths, if you're finding that you're having intermittent s signal continuity through the module, um, uh, and you've done your cleaning here, another place to check is this toggle switch. It faces up, depending on the environment your machine's been in, uh, dirt, debris, uh, and whatnot can get down in here. So sometimes uh, I will just take a jet of deoxy D5 straight down in here, flip the other way, jet it down in there, don't be shy. It's going to get everywhere. It will drip all over everything. It's okay. It's not going to ruin your um, components that are mounted to the board. But then exercise that thing. Flip it back and forth rapidly, 25 times, 50 times. Um, and then you can take some canned air and blow in there and then maybe just do another shot um, if you're having some stubborn issues and then exercise it some more. That's just another um, thing that might help you, might be problematic on yours. I'm not having problems on mine because, again, uh, fastener heads all around um, this uh, um, uh, electro-galvanized uh, sheet metal is all very uh, oxidation and rust-free, uh, so I'm fortunate on that. But if yours is not in that condition, doesn't mean it's the end of the world for you. It just means you might have to work a little harder for it. So, so that's the uh, update for tonight. Uh, another look at the guts and innards. Um, hope this has been helpful or entertaining in some way. Uh, please consider subscribing to my channel. Um, like the video. Um, do those things. I always appreciate that. Again, hope it's been helpful. I'll keep putting this stuff up. And I always say, if you've got questions or comments, um, please leave a comment, ask a question uh, in the comment section. I'm pretty good about following up and responding in detail. Um, uh, I don't mind helping folks and uh, enjoy talking about this stuff. So anyway, thanks for watching and uh, take care.